Good morning. Welcome to The Edge. My name is Brandy, and I'm so glad that you've joined us today as we continue our series through the Book of Acts called Empowered, where we are taking a look at how the early church began and how God's Spirit empowered those who would believe in Him to not only preach the good news of Christ, but to do His work on earth. If you are someone who likes um, action-packed and fast-paced types of movies, well, then you are going to love this series because the book of Acts is exactly how it sounds. It is full of action, ups and downs, trials and triumphs. But more importantly, it is laced with the evidence of God's Spirit empowering His people. And that same Spirit that lived in them lives in those of us today who have received Christ. In today's text, we're going to be looking at an amazing miracle that took place with a lame man who from birth had not been able to walk and was instantly healed, not just physically, but spiritually as well. So we're going to read directly from the text, Acts 3, 1 through 10. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John, and then Peter said, Look at us. So the man gave, him his, gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. And then Peter said, Silver or gold do I, I do not have, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk, and then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as that lame man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I bet they were. Can you just imagine? Can you imagine what it would have been like to witness this miracle? I mean, here's this man who every day sat a helpless beggar in the spot that he was placed. And now all of a sudden, he's not just healed a little bit, but he is fully healed. And it shows him walking and leaping and praising God. This miracle, it goes on to show us, really paved the way for Peter to give this amazing sermon where he was able to describe to onlookers who Jesus was and the power of his resurrection. See, Peter and John were apostles, which means really another word for ambassadors. They were sent out on a mission, and their mission was to spread the gospel. And this miracle they were empowered to do, but it paved the way for the message. See, the story starts with Peter and John going to the temple to pray which was not an unusual thing. It was Jewish tradition. There were different times during the day that the Jews would go and pray. There was a prayer of sacrifice and all different kinds of prayer. But the reason that the author Luke wants to give us the exact time, it says it was at three o'clock, was because he wants us to understand that the time was significant. The time of prayer, three o'clock, is exactly when it's recorded in the Gospels that Jesus actually died on the cross. It was three o'clock when it says that he gave up his spirit and cried out, it is finished. So it was at that time of day and with that sentiment that Peter and John were headed to church to pray and worship. And we can learn a lot already by their approach to worship. Because if you think about it, they were on a mission. They were headed to church, and it would have been a very um, obvious thing for them to assume that going to church would have been the most important part of their day. I mean, they couldn't be bothered for lesser things, right? It would have been understandable if they had just kind of given a nod to the man or 
or, or just kind of said, hey, I'll, I'll get back to you in a minute. Three o'clock, it's really important that we get there on time, right? That would have been understandable. But instead of having that type of approach, Peter and John understood that it wasn't about going to church. They understood that they now were the church. And they looked at this opportunity that God had put in their path as a divine interruption, and they were obedient to the call. Boy, we can just learn so much from that because, friends, if our church activity and our service to the Lord doesn't ever lead us to people outside of the walls of our church, then we're really missing out. Colossians 4, 5, and 6 says, be wise in the way that you act toward outsiders, making the most of every opportunity. So when we come to worship, we need to be mindful of what it is we're bringing. So oftentimes we get it backward and we take this approach when we go to church of what we're going to get. Oh, I hope I like the songs today. I wonder who's preaching. I really like that person more than this person. I wonder who I'm going to see today. I don't really feel like being social. I wonder if the breakfast is going to be any good, right? We can have these thoughts. But God wants us to approach worship with this intention of what we bring, of who we bring. He wants us to bring who we are, and he wants us to bring what we have. That is what Peter and John did. They offered who they were, and they offered what they had. I love Philippians 2.1 because it says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love or any common sharing in his spirit, if any compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having that same love, and being one in spirit and one of mind. And that is exactly what Peter and John did. In fact, it says that they stopped and looked straight at this man. That original text gives the um, indication that they fixed their gaze on this man. So they were, they were focused on him. They didn't just glance his way. They were intentional and they were focused. And already, I just wonder how that might have felt to this man. Because I don't know, but I just imagine that probably not a lot of people that passed by him, especially if their focus was going to the temple, was to stop and fix their attention on this man. I mean, he might have had plenty of people walk by from time to time and throw some change in the bucket. In fact, he probably made a decent living there because back then in Jewish tradition, if you were to um, almsgiving or uh, give your money to the poor, that was actually something that was considered something that would gain you some spiritual merit in that culture. So it's very understandable why this lame man's loved ones would have sat him and positioned him right there. It was probably a decent place for him to beg. But I just wonder how often anyone would stop and entertain him and give him their attention. And see, we see accounts all over the Gospels of how Jesus interacted with people and we know that when he interacted with someone, he gave them his attention and he gave them their dignity. And as a church, we are called to do this very thing. And I tell you what, it's going to be a lot easier for us to know how to engage someone or how to help someone when we actually give them our attention and take notice of their surroundings and what they're going through and their circumstances. See, in our culture today, I wonder if the slowing down and noticing who's in need around us is possibly our greatest obstacle. Or just being willing to pause and really give someone our attention. I think so many of us think that we don't have very many um, divine encounters, God-ordained encounters, but I wonder how much more we would believe that we did if we really were just willing to pause and give someone our attention. That's what Paul and Peter did. And when they did, listen to what they said. They said, silver and gold have I none, but what I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. See, when it says in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, there's a reason that Peter proclaimed it just that way. Because the word name is more than just like 
the name someone gave you at birth, it denotes position and power and authority. So what Peter is saying is, hey, this command that I'm giving you to rise up and walk is actually coming from the authority and the position and the power of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. In case anybody listening didn't get it, this is the same Jesus Christ of Nazareth who was just murdered on that cross. So if anyone around were to believe that he was still, you know, dead and buried and not alive today, this was Peter and John's way of announcing, hey, watch this, look what we're going to do, and it is in the name of that Jesus. I love that Peter and John didn't try to offer what they didn't have. It's, they said they didn't have any money, which honestly could have been a pretty humble thing to admit because it was true back then and it's true today. Money equals status and power, typically in culture, doesn't it? And to say that they didn't have any money, well, that could have indicated like weakness or an inability to help because what more could you give to somebody than money? But they were getting to demonstrate that what this guy was asking for, he had an even greater need and God was the only one that was going to be able to fill it. And while they may not have had money, they knew that they possessed a spiritual authority through Christ and empowered by their spirit to offer something that this man needed on an even deeper level. And if we could really grasp, if God could open our spiritual eyes and reveal to us what we actually possess, God's spirit, which answers the deepest cry of the broken world's heart, boy, wouldn't we be able to give something that these people around us really, really need. I almost even wonder if, if, if money may have possibly be, been a hindrance. This is just conjecture, but I'm thinking about it, and I'm thinking, you know, if they had had money in their pocket and they're on their way to church, maybe they could have thought, oh, this man wants money. It's the nicest thing I can do just to offer it to him. And that would have been a nice gesture. And it may even stood out to him and even helped him maybe a little bit for the next meal or maybe even the next day. You know, it may be that sometimes when we feel like we are um, bereft of resources, it could possibly be that God is asking us to dig deeper to see the greater thing that we have to offer. Because if Peter and John had just had money and just given them their money, they may not have taken that next step to offer what we would now see to be the miracle. And we really need to be far more concerned. This just reminds me that we need to be far more concerned about um, not how much money we have, but how much spiritual authority we have and we're exercising. And we need to be concerned in the same way with our churches. We're always concerned if our churches don't have enough money, but we really need to be concerned if we have churches that are powerless and not offering the true and trans transformational life that Christ has to offer. I read this quote, and I wish I could, I, I can't find who it's from, but I didn't come up with it. I really liked it, though. It says this, our ultimate purpose is not to help manage broken lives, but to reveal a transformed life in Christ. See, what Peter and John did was they not only spoke life to this man, but they also helped him. We need to be willing not to just speak into the lives of broken people, but to extend our practical help as well. Notice it says that Peter reached out and grabbed this man and helped him up. Peter didn't require this man to, you know, say a certain thing or act a certain way before he helped him. Peter saw with spiritual eyes what God saw in this man. He saw his potential, and he also saw his humanity and his weakness, and he met him where he was at, and he helped him with the love of Christ. Oh, Lord, that he would give us the spiritual eyes to see people the way that he sees them and to see ourselves the way he sees us, because we are all broken and helpless outside of the power of Christ. We, like the lame man, are sitting outside of the temple, if you will, with no way in outside of the forgiveness of Christ. See, the challenge in this story really is to see ourselves in both parties. 
On the one hand, we need to identify with Peter and John, because if you call yourself a Christ follower today, you also are an ambassador for Christ with a message of reconciliation. You are also indwelled with the power of the Holy Spirit enabled to speak life and truth into people's lives and offering them the help to take their next step toward God. But at the same time, we also need to remember that spiritually speaking, we are the lame man. From birth, we are helpless, born with a sin condition that is woven into our DNA. From birth, and it has left us utterly broken, unable to stand in the presence of God. There is no amount of money or self-help or good deeds or even religious activities that can make us right with God. It is only by the power, authority, and name of Jesus Christ, whose death on the cross made the way for us. And you see, once this lame man was healed, he's no longer hoping to get something from the worshiping community, but he now goes into the temple courts with Peter and John. He is a part of the fellowship of this community. And now he's going in with his worship and his praise, but also with purpose and a testimony. See, when we accept Jesus as our Savior, his Spirit not only cleanses us from our sin, but it enters us permanently, securing our salvation. And we now have become the temple of the Holy Spirit. We don't go to a temple. We are the temple. We are the vessel through which God's Spirit manifests His nature and empowers us to worship. That is what Christ does in us and through us. And you better believe that this man's path dramatically changed going forward. Just look at how he responded. He didn't just like get up and like you would think that he would kind of get up kind of like baby deerish and <laughs> timidly walk or like when a baby's learning to walk, how they kind of like cruise the furniture and then try to stand up for a second and then fall. But it wasn't like that. And just this, this part alone blows my mind. He was not only instantly healed, but he was also strong. Let the weak become strong. You know, uh, years ago, when I was pregnant with my twins, I had to go on um, this unforeseen and immediate bed rest. I was on bed rest for almost 20 weeks. And the part that nobody tells you about bed rest is how weak your muscles get. I mean, it makes sense now, but at the time, I didn't see that coming. And so as the babies were getting bigger and my belly was getting bigger and I was gaining more and more weight, seemed like by the day, I was also getting weaker because the longer you sit and the less resistance your muscles engage, the more they atrophy and become weak. So I can remember, you know, the one time a day I could walk down the stairs, sit on the couch, and then at the end of the day, walk back up to the bed. Toward the end of the pregnancy, it was like the walking just became harder and harder because my legs were so weak. So I'm like, my mind's blown when I read this story and I imagine a man who has literally never stood on his own two legs in 40 years. And he pops up and he starts leaping and dancing and praising God. Amazing. And remember, this miracle is what made the way then for Peter to be able to preach, but also for this man to have his own ministry. Because don't you imagine that even though we don't know much about this lame man after the fact and after this story, I have a feeling that he had a pretty local ministry happening. I have a feeling that the other beggars around the beautiful gate are people that he had a real heart for. I mean, that was his community beforehand. And don't you think that he probably also had um, a passion for the community of disabled people? <laughs> vulnerable people, those in the margins, because he would know what that felt like. See, that's what God can do for us. He not only can heal us in our pain points, but when he has healed us, he gives us purpose even in that pain. And I believe that that's what went on to happen to this man. It's an amazing story on so many levels. 
But I don't want to overlook the fact that when we read stories of like this, stories like this, we can be both excited about the possibility of these types of miracles, or we can be frustrated because maybe we haven't seen miracles like this in our own life. So we have to kind of wrestle with this. We have to wrestle with the, the tension of the fact that we know that God can do these things, but maybe we haven't seen it as much as we would like. Why doesn't God heal people every time? Maybe you're sitting here today and you're personally disappointed with someone, a miracle that you prayed for, for yourself or a loved one, and God didn't respond with that miracle that you were hoping for and you so believed for. What do we do with that? Well, it's interesting because you have to kind of ask the question, why wasn't this man healed before the day he was healed? Because chances are Peter and John were coming to that temple multiple times a day. They were local, and it says this man sat right outside that gate. And, and honestly, if you really want to kind of blow your mind, it's very reasonable to assume that Jesus himself had probably passed by this man many times. This was a very popular gate and a popular temple, and we know that Jesus frequented the temple. So it's, it's very probable that Jesus himself would have passed by this man and hadn't healed him up to this point. So it's like somewhere along the way, we have to trust God for his timing and his purpose and his intentions. And so while his ways are mysterious and they are not our ways, we have to believe and trust in his goodness, in his sovereignty, in his timing, and to know all the puzzle pieces that take place. But no doubt, we're going to be seeing lots more miracles throughout this series because Acts is full of them. And for some of you, it's really going to ignite a faith in you to be praying in ways um, that you haven't before. And in others of you, it might stir up um, some frustration about past hurts and disappointments. So I just want to leave you with a few thoughts when it comes to, to miracles and kind of how to think about this, just, just personally based on what I've seen. So a few themes that I've seen weaved through some of the miracle stories of the New Testament are this. Well, in this story in particular, number one, Peter and John, they stepped out in faith with both a proclamation and a willingness to help as they were prompted by the Holy Spirit. So that's one thing. The second thing is we have to believe and know that God knows the heart of man. We're told that over and over in Scripture. And only God would have known when this lame man would have been ready to receive not only the physical miracle, but to receive the miracle maker himself. Because miracles aren't meant to leave us in awe just of the miracle, but they are to put us back into that um, attention on God and who he is and what he can do and to bring us back to him. So only God knows when a person is in that place. And number three, both parties, the apostles and the lame man, used this miracle to point back to God. See, Peter, directly following this miracle, he didn't just call it a day. He used that opportunity to tell other people about Jesus. And we're going to hear about that in the following week. And likewise, the lame man just didn't take his miracle and run. It says that he went on to praise God and become a worshiper, a living testimony. So both of these people took the miracle, but really it was the miracle worker, God himself, that they pointed back to. Listen, it is a mystery why some receive healing in the physical and others do not. And yet we have to be honest and say that, you know, strange but true, many of us, if we're honest with ourselves, it is in our times of struggling, our times of limitation, our times of desperation and neediness that we have been drawn back to God in our lives. Ultimately, our life is short, and God is pursuing his children here on earth while there is still time to secure them eternally and bring them back to himself. Trust me, I 
th this was a struggle of a sermon to write and even to give because I don't know if this will be true by the time you're listening to this message, but at this very moment, my own beloved grandpa is on his deathbed and he actually has not had either one of his legs for the last five years because of severe diabetes, Parkinson's, and other complications. He lost both of his legs to amputations, and he has suffered tremendously over the last handful of years and, in, and, and is on his deathbed right now. And my whole family has begged God for a miracle or to take him home, and yet it lingers. And yet I'm reading the story, and there's a tension here. You guys, like we, we accept what God can do. We ask him for the healings that we know that he can bring to our loved ones. But ultimately, there has to be a trust in his goodness, in his heart for man, and in his character as well. There is no hard and fast formula. The formula is to believe that God can and to trust him ultimately with what he chooses to do. But I know for me, and I'm sure for you, I don't want to miss any miracles that I could be privy to here on earth. And so if you want to be a part of more miracles, then I would say, ask God, can I be trusted with the miracles that you have? Am I a person that you can entrust miracles to? Am I someone that will use the miracle to point back to you? Am I someone that will tell of the miracles that you've already done for me and put it on display? Are you currently putting on display the miracles of the things that God has already done for you? Is your marriage a miracle today? Then proclaim it and talk to others who really need the faith to believe that God can turn theirs around too. Is your pregnancy or um, the fact that you even have children a miracle for God and you know it? What about your sobriety? What about your mental health, your relationship, your job, your health status? Are these things miracles? Is your house a miracle? <laughs> Put it on display and tell others and pray for those miracles for others to see God's love and provision and activity in their life. Put it on display for the broken world to see so that you and those around you will be filled, just like they were in this story, with awe and wonder at a God who loves us so much that he gave his one and only son so that we could have eternity with him. And may we be a people who are empowered both in trials and triumphs, in the miracles and the mundane, to say that you, Lord, have made known to us the path of life, and you fill us with joy in your presence. Thank you, Edge Church. We'll see you next week.